Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the MLA Sheep Productivity and Profitability webinar series. Tonight's webinar is on the effective control of worms in prime lamb flocks. For those who are joining us for the first time this evening, you'll have this control panel on the right hand side of your screen. You can hear us, but we can't hear you. Collapse the control panel using the red button and that will allow you to see the entire screen. And if you have any questions, please type them in uh, the questions box uh, on the control panel. Uh, you can send them in at any time and our presenter this evening has kindly offered to stay in line for as long as we require to answer any questions. They'll be logged chronologically with me and we'll deal with them one by one at the end of the webinar. Next week, we're going to be hosting another MLA webinar, and that webinar is on Wednesday, May 16, and the title of that webinar is Understanding and Managing New Disease Challenges Around Lambing and Through Lactation. That webinar is to be presented by a Tasmanian vet, Dr. Paul Nylon, and he will be reviewing all the best information and research that we need to be able to answer that question. You would have seen, for those who joined us early, a, a poll at the start of this webinar. Thanks for participating in that poll. And you would have seen the outcome that a majority of the audience considers a pre-lambing drench to be the most important drench to give to prime lamb use. And I'll be interested to see the opinion of our presenter tonight, who is Dr. B. Kirk. And B is a consultant at the McKinnon Project, University of Melbourne. B completed her Masters on Worms in Western Victorian Prime Lamb Flocks in 2016 and this was the Victorian part of Lifting Limits, an MLA funded project across four regions in Eastern Australia. Her work at the McKinnon Project involves teaching, research and consultancy. She looks forward to starting a producer demonstration site later this year on using EID to monitor use throughout the product production year to improve their productivity and welfare. Also uh, tonight, we are to be joined by Dr. Angus Campbell, also of the McKinnon Project. We're very lucky as Angus has worked as a livestock vet for over 20 years and is a senior veterinary consultant with the McKinnon Project. Uh, he works with beef and sheep producers and corporate agribusiness throughout southeastern Australia to improve management of livestock health, nutrition and farm profitability. He has practical expertise in disease investigation, management, ruminant nutrition, animal health, economics and on-farm research. So we're really lucky to have both Dr B Kirk and Dr Angus Campbell of the McKinnon Project uh, with us this evening. B will be doing the presentation and Angus will be joining us at the end of the webinar to contribute to the uh, robust Q&A session that we always have as a part of these MLA webinars. With that, I'd like to welcome B to the webinar. Can you hear us there, B? Yes, I can, David. Thank you. Welcome to the webinar, and we can see your screen. Okay. And um, looking forward to the presentation. Excellent. Thanks, David. Um, so, just to give an overview about uh, what we're going to be talking about tonight, first just going over the basics of worm species, their population dynamics and their effect. Talking about worm control programs then, focusing on the winter rainfall areas of southeastern Australia and uniform rainfall areas uh, and with a comment on other areas as well. Then we'll talk about um, why merino worm control programs don't necessarily work in prime land flocks and then go over some take home messages as well. Um, so first of all, how much do worms cost? Uh, so it's been estimated in a recent MLA report that worms in a, in a moderately affected flock, worms cost about $12 per sheep per annum. Um, in a severely affected flock, they can cost up to $28 per sheep per annum. 
And the reason that worms um, cause a problem um, is that they cause inflammation. So this is scar worms I'm talking about now. Um, they can cause inflammation, so the sheep can't absorb the nutrients. They also, they decrease appetite uh, by up to 60% um, decrease in dry matter intake, decrease the weight gain, muscle and dressing percentage as well. And because worms induce a hypersensitivity or allergy type response in the sheep, we also get an increase in scouring and DAG. So that means more crutching, more chemical application and problems with fly strike as well. Um, and worms can cause deaths as well. So whilst um, obviously homonchus in the um, summer rainfall and uniform areas can cause deaths, in the scour worms can cause deaths as well. So in severe outbreaks in Western Victoria, we can see up to a 30% mortality. So tonight I'm mostly gonna be talking about these areas that are in red here. So the winter dominant um, temperate areas and uniform rainfall areas of Eastern Australia. And I'm gonna make a comment on the other areas on the map. So in these areas in red, the worms that we see most often and that causes the most problems are the brown stomach worm or Ostertagia, which is actually now known as Teledorsagia, um, and black scale worms or trikes. Uh, Barber's pole worm or homonchus doesn't tend to be as big a problem uh, in these areas. We generally only see it in pockets. However, um, we did see a lot more of it this summer just gone than we usually do. The large intestinal worms, Schubertia and esophagostomum, um, they don't, they're less important because they don't cause a problem to the sheep, but they do contribute to worm egg counts. Um, and so um, they can, um, influence their results. So let's talk about the um, basics of the worm population or an overview of the worm population. And this is important uh, because a lot of um, our, or some of our worm control programs come from um, these um, population dynamics, if you like, of worms. So firstly, it takes at least three weeks um, for larvae um, that have been eaten by a sheep um, to become egg-laying adults. And this is known as the pre-patent period. And we'll talk again about this in a moment and why it's important. Um, it can take up to several months for eggs that are put out onto pasture to get to the stage where they're able to infect a sheep. And larvae develop more slowly in colder weather. So again, this is the scale worms. So they can take a couple of months to develop. Also, the number of larvae on the pasture that are at that infective stage, which is the stage that they're able to infect a sheep, vary throughout the year. So we tend to see the highest larvae, and this is called larval availability. We tend to see the highest larval availability in winter when it's cool and wet in these temperate areas. And then we get a dilution effect over the spring as it gets warmer and drier. And we, as we get pasture growth, um, the, the number of larvae per bite of pasture that sheep eat decreases as well. And then we have the least amount of, least number of larvae that are available in hot, dry weather during the summer. Also, worms can survive for a long time on pasture throughout the winter especially. So this can um, give us some problems with paddock preparation. So for example, um, worms will quite happily survive um, for well over a month um, in winter. So spelling pastures for a month um, will not um, make them clean, for example. Um, so we need to use other grazing management methods. Also, it's just worth noting that the worms that sheep pick up in autumn come from eggs that have been put on the pasture in late spring or early summer. And worms that are picked up in winter come from eggs that have been put on that pasture in mid late summer, so January, February. And this is um, important when we come to our strategic drenches. Also, a significant thing is that we tend to see an increase in ewe worm egg counts around lambing. And this is called the periparturient rise. So ewes temporarily around lambing lose their immunity and become more susceptible to worms. So 
this is illustrated by this graph on the left, on the right, sorry, that you see. So the horizontal axis is showing the number of weeks in relation to lambing. So week zero is the week of lambing. And the vertical axis is showing the worm egg count. So you can see these are just, the different coloured bars are just um, experimentally different ewes, but you can see that these, um, the worm egg counts of these ewes increases during that early lactation period. So this is the periparturient rise. As I, it makes ewes more susceptible to worms, but also it's important because it increases the contamination of the pasture for the lambs that are gonna be grazing if they're still grazing that pasture later on down the track, two or three months. Um, let's talk now about worm control programs. Now, um, a lot of the research or most of the research to date in Australia has been done um, on worms in merino flocks. And so um, a lot of, so the worm control programs in prime land flocks are sort of based on the research done in merinos. So in the temperate areas, this includes doing regular drench resistance tests every two or three years so that we know which drenches are effective on our farm. It also includes using combination drenches rather than single actives because it's been shown not only in modelling but also in on-farm trials that using combination drenches slows down the development of drench resistance. It's really important, although it's a basic recommendation, it's really important to dose accurately as well. So weigh sheep using scales, dose to the heaviest in the mob and calibrate drench guns as well to make sure that they're getting the right dose of an effective drench. So um, we come now to our um, summer drenches or strategic drenches and these are really important. So a strategic drench is a drench of the pasture not of the sheep. So we're not drenching the sheep because the sheep are wormy. We're drenching the sheep to reduce the pasture contamination over the summer and reduce the number of larvae on the pasture in the following autumn and winter. Um, so the number, the timing and number of summer drenches is variable depending on the environment, history and degree of worm control on the property as well as the season. So two summer drenches are usually required in higher rainfall areas or in wet seasons. And the first summer drench is usually given to all mobs in early December after the pasture's dried off, unless their worm egg count is zero. So any worm egg count, so it's quite a very low threshold different to our drenches through the winter. The second summer drench is then given in February to mobs with worm egg counts higher than 50 to 80 eggs per gram. And again, this is a lower threshold than our tactical drenches. So this, the 50 eggs per gram, the lower of, these, of this range is more for high rainfall areas or high stocking rates because the, these really low counts still uh, mean that there's considerable contamination going on on that pasture over the summer. That 80 eggs per gram, the higher end of the range, it's for lower rainfall areas and lower stocking rates. And the second summer drench should be given at least a month before you're expecting the autumn break. Um, now, a comment on the summer drench is that lower rainfall areas, um, those that are experiencing a dry summer or farms that have got excellent worm control can give just one summer drench and that's usually given in late December or early January and prime lamb flocks sometimes um, fall into this category as well and we'll talk about that again later. So grazing management is also important um, in a worm control program and there are a couple of main ways you can do this including smart grazing. Now smart grazing uses the um, the prepayment period that I talked about earlier. So um, it, you've got a sort of a window of opportunity there where after a drench, a sheep is, when it's grazing, it's eating larvae, but it's not actually producing any eggs. So it's effectively cleaning um, the paddock for you. So smart grazing is used along with the strategic drenches. So um, the sheep that have been drenched can be used to graze a paddock at two and a half to three times the normal stocking rate for up to, but no longer than four weeks after a drench is given. And that can be done with one or both summer drenches. And that creates a lower contamination paddock for use in the following autumn and winter. 
Another way of using grazing management in a worm control program is grazing with cattle if they're available. And whilst you get the best effect from um, grazing with cattle for six months, we do get a lot of benefit and a lot of reduction in sheep worms um, with grazing um, with cattle for at least eight weeks. So the tactical treatments are a different purpose to the strategic treatments in that we're treating sheep because they are wormy and they need a drench. So we need to monitor our worm, our weaners, worm egg counts four to six weekly from the autumn break. In terms of ewes, um, some producers give a pre-lamb drench to use two to six weeks before lambing or at lamb marking. Um, and this can be based on worm egg count, um, ewe condition score, pasture availability, or sometimes as an insurance policy as well. Um, and the re there's been a lot of research done into pre-lamb drenching onto contaminated pastures, which most pastures um, in temperate rainfall areas are contaminated in winter because the larvae live for so long. Um, so it's been found that there's no long-term benefit to either the ewe or the lamb um, from a pre-lamb drench. So by that I mean the ewes aren't any heavier if they've had a pre-lamb drench, the lambs aren't any heavier. Wool production's no different either. But what that worm-free day does by giving a, a pre-lamb drench or a marking drench to the ewe is to, it may prevent them from dying if they're right on the edge um, of, you know, suffering from mortality from worms. Um, also, um, in terms of our worm control programs in our lambs, um, some farmers give a marking drench to lambs, which is not effective if lambs are one to six weeks of age, so the usual marking age, and if they're drinking milk. So firstly, um, lambs aren't grazing enough at that age to have a significant worm burden. And also milk is a really effective antihelmintic, really effective drench. So whilst lambs are getting most of their nutrition from milk, a drench will not be effective at marking. Uh, however, the weaning drench is really important or a drench at 12 to 14 weeks. And lots of work has shown that delaying drenching of lambs much after that 12 to 14 weeks of age leads to problems with worms, so signs of worms and deaths as well. So because weaning can be much later in prime lamb flocks and merino flocks, um, we still we recommend drenching at 12 to 14 weeks after lambing starts um, if lambs are to be drenched, if lambs are to be weaned late, say 18 to 20 weeks. Another point is to select rams with ASBVs for low worm egg counts. And if we have a look at our graph again, um, I'll, yeah, the blue bars there are from a line of um, control ewes. So these ewes haven't been selected um, for uh, low WEC ASBVs. And the red bars on that graph are the resistant um, line of ewes that have been selected for low weight ASBVs. And this is after several years of selection. And you can see that although both ewes have that peri, both sets of ewes have that periparturient rise, um, the resistant ewes, their rise is much lower than the control ewes. So, and so that's a, there are benefits to be gained after um, some time. However, um, it's important to not forget about our production traits because our production traits and WEC uh, can be negatively correlated. So using an index is a good idea here. Just a comment on other environments. Um, so in the summer rainfall areas, um, so northern tablelands, it's important to keep monitoring our worm egg counts regularly, um, drench use pre-lambing and lambs at weaning and consider using Barbavax if Barber, Barber's Pole is a problem on your farm. In uniform rainfall areas of New South Wales, again, monitoring worm egg counts of weaners um, regularly and doing a PCR, which is a molecular test or larval culture to look for Barber's Pole worm as well. Um, a shout out to our um, listeners from WA. Um, because of the really long, uh, hot, dry summer um, over in WA. It is a, 
a more selective environment um, over the summer, so we see more larval death. Uh, so we, the recommendation is to drench adult sheep in autumn rather than summer. Um, preparing low worm risk paddocks um, is important and there's an extra uh, note there to be cautious when using long acting drenches because of that more selective environment. So let's look now at some features of prime name enterprises that um, mean that we need to tweak or change our um, merino based worm control programs a bit. Firstly, there's a lot of variation but even between prime name enterprises. So we've got a lot of um, different systems there, different breeds of ewes um, being used and different breeds of lambs um, being grown and also different target markets and weights too and different times of weaning. So there's a lot of variability there. So one size does not fit all. The growth rate as well. So we're um, aiming to grow lambs um, profitably um, to a target weight and um, wrap it as quickly as we can, as long as it's profitable, um, as opposed to a merino system where we're aiming for a slower growth or maintenance in the case of, for example, weathers. <coughs> Um, some prime lamb enterprises will join hoggets as well. So um, because hoggets are still, um, because they're younger, they haven't um, obtained their full immunity to worms yet. They haven't developed um, their immunity completely. So we've got a group of animals that are undergoing the, the stresses of pregnancy and lactation at a time where they're still growing and developing their own immunity. So we've got a potentially vulnerable group of animals here that we need to look after. The time of lambing is uh, different in a lot of prime lamb enterprises as well. So the optimal time of lambing in terms of gross margin, and this has been shown by um, Lisa Warren and others, um, is uh, so five or six months before the pasture dries off. But this often coincides with the time of peak larval availability through those winter months. Um, and the time of weaning, as I've said, so that um, 12 to 14 uh, week weaning drench works really well in merino systems, doesn't fit as neatly into prime lamb systems that wean their lambs later. And so um, we need to um, act appropriately um, to drench at 12 to 14 weeks if we're going to be weaning later to avoid problems with worms. So let's look now at some research that's been done specifically um, in prime lamb flocks. So firstly, um, Ian Carmichael uh, looked at a number of farms in southwestern Victoria and southeast and South Australia um, over four years and he compared worm free uh, ewes and lambs to uh, ewes and lambs that were treated normally um, according to the farm's own worm control program. Um, the worm control programs on these farms are really variable. Some worked well um, and some weren't very effective. Um, those farms that were able to prepare clean pastures um, for their lambs to be weaned onto or to lamb their ewes on, um, were, their programs worked better. Um, and poor lamb, the, the poor lamb growth um, that was sometimes seen on these farms after weaning was mostly due to poor nutrition rather than worms. So the second research project, uh, and the one I'm going to talk mostly about tonight, um, is Lifting the Limits, so an MLA funded um, project uh, based, uh, conducted on 18 farms in four regions of Eastern Australia over three years, and we've got the four regions on the map there, the Northern Tablelands, um, Central Tablelands, Southwest Slopes, and Western Victoria. And we compared worm-free ewes and lambs to those run under the farm's own worm control program. So the ewes on these farms were kept worm free uh, with three consecutive capsules, one after the other, between scanning and pre-lambing. Now I have to say here that um, this we were not um, doing this as a recommendation to use capsules or to trial it as a worm control program in itself. Um, these capsules were used as a research tool to create a negative control. So with our, we were comparing our um, normal treatment use to what our worm-free use were doing. The lambs are also kept worm-free and we divided these into four groups so that we could look at the effect 
of the ewes worms on her lactation and therefore her lamb's growth and the effect of the lamb's own worms on its growth. Um, we looked at a whole bunch of parameters um, over three production years and um, in terms of the, the Victorian results of this project, this is what we found. Um, so the main things we found were that being worm free for nine months had a variable effect on new weight. So in some cases, um, there was no difference between the worm free use and the normal use instead of uh, in terms of um, body weight. In other, on other occasions, there was a six kilo difference. Um, so our worm free use was six kilos heavier sometimes than our uh, normal use at pre-joining. And we found that most of the time when our worm free use was significantly heavier than our normal use was after a tight winter and where you body condition was low. So you condition score and pasture availability were critical. They were really important in terms of determining whether um, uh, the worm, being worm free had an effect on body weight. Worm egg count um, was important pre-lambing, um, so it was important to do monitor counts, but we also need to use other information as well to decide whether or not we're going to drench, namely ewe condition score and pasture dry matter. So we had, for example, a couple of occasions uh, during in Western Victoria where um, at marking the ewes had an egg count of 800 eggs per gram as an average, the non-worm free ewes this is. Um, now that's a really high count for Western Victoria um, and if we were to see those counts in merinos we'd probably be seeing or we would be seeing signs of worms and we might be seeing deaths as well. Um, but these ewes were in pretty good condition so they were in condition score three minus on average, um, had lots of feed ahead of them um, and we there was no sign of worms. Um, and we also had the opposite happen. We had times when um, there was, or in, in terms of, we had relatively low worm egg counts during the year, so they never got to say over 300 eggs per gram, um, but, and we didn't actually see any signs of worms necessarily, but we did see a big difference in um, body weight at the end at pre-joining um, because these ewes are a bit lighter and they didn't have as much pasture available. Thirdly, our single bearing ewes are much less affected by worms than our multiple or twin bearing ewes were. So in the couple of mobs of single bearing ewes that we monitored, we found that they actually gained weight between pre-lambing and lamb marking despite um, having had a lamb and starting to lactate. And so we can see that there are some gains in efficiency to be made here and we can allocate that feed to a multiple bearing ewes that need it more. So to go over some, or to talk about some take home messages um, from this project. Firstly, worm control programs are still really important. So we need to keep doing drench resistance tests, worm egg counts, um, our strategic treatments are really important to reduce that pasture contamination uh, liable contamination in the following uh, autumn and winter and um, grazing management as well. As I said, we may only need one summer drench in prime lamb flocks. So um, instead of giving a drench in early December um, just as a matter of routine, it's worth monitoring in prime lamb flocks and um, no drench is needed um, until the count comes up above zero. So we might be able to give a summer drench in say late December, early January, but we need to monitor those counts. Secondly, mature ewes are really resilient if they're fed well, and this especially is true for single bearing ewes. Where we will see effects of worms when condition score is low, or that's when we tend to see them, so 2.5 or less. So ewes in poorer body condition or with less feed available are not resilient to worms. Hoggets are they, they're in a different category, they are vulnerable. They're not as resilient as mature ewes, so we need to look after them. Um, we need to interpret our worm egg counts along with condition score and feed availability as well. So whilst I said that we weren't using capsules to um, 
try them out as a worm control program, we can say from our results that blanket camp capsule treatment, so treating a whole mob of ewes, is seldom worthwhile. So our capsule ewes, our worm-free ewes, um, they didn't have any lower mortality rate um, and their condition score at marking wasn't necessarily higher than our non-worm-free ewes. Um, but there are cases where capsule treatment uh, might be appropriate and that is for example in years that where the feed is really tight, ewes are really light um, and especially if um, either of those conditions is met in a hoggett mob. A word on lambs, our worm free lambs weren't often heavier than our non-worm free lambs but we did see some effects of worms on ewe lactation as assessed by lamb weights. Also, as Ian Carmichael found, um, a lot of, we found that nutrition and good quality, really good quality nutrition was critical for lamb growth. So uh, sometimes when our, our both the, non, the worm free and the non worm free lambs were growing poorly um, due to uh, nutrition not being good enough quality. Also drenching before weaning um, didn't increase lamb growth, but a drench at 12 to 14 weeks was important if we we're weaning late. I do want to stress that although uh, some of our recommendations are about nutrition, we can't take our eye off the ball. We can still get caught out by worms in prime lamb flocks, even though these animals are more resilient. The sheep are more resilient. Just some extra take home messages for the Tablelands and Southwest Slopes sites for lifting the limits project. A pre-lamb drench um, is rec was recommended um, on in these sites um, in the tablelands as a strategic treatment, so to reduce the pasture contamination further on or later on down the track. And uh, lambs should be grazed on low worm risk pastures after weaning. So in terms of uh, resources, and I know this has been a um, there's a lot more I could have talked about. Um, tonight, in terms of extra resources, if you're looking for more information, um, your advisor or consultant is a really important resource um, because they've got the local knowledge. So I, tonight I've been talking mostly about the winter rainfall areas, the temperate areas. Um, so, and it's really dangerous to take advice um, from one environment and assume about worm control and assume that it applies to your environment. So um, local knowledge is really important. There are also some good um, MLA final reports out there and some really good stuff on the Worm Boss and Making More From Sheep websites. So that's it from me. That's excellent, B. Thank you very much. Uh, a, very, uh, a very comprehensive presentation and covered often a few areas and a few regions. I'm just going to take the stage for a minute and give you a break. Now, don't forget the post-webinar survey that will pop up on your screen after tonight's uh, webinar. Now, we do take them seriously. We always consider them um, and provide that feedback to the presenter, uh, you know, obviously without contact details for privacy. But we do provide all of the feedback to MLA so that they can uh, apply the uh, apply the information and the decision making for future extension activities. Don't forget next week we have Dr. Paul Nylon from Tasmania presenting on um, disease management in prime lamb use at and around the lambing time to reduce um, to reduce um, uh, the met 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 um, reduce disease pressure on the prime lamb use and um, keep your keep your emails and uh, keep your eye on your emails and on your texts uh, we'll be sending out more information about future webinars as soon as that information comes online now I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, Angus to the webinar Dr Angus Campbell can you hear us there Uh, Good day, David. I can. I hope that uh, you can hear me as well. Yeah, can hear you very clearly. Thanks for joining us this evening. No problem. Thanks. It's great to be along. Thank you. Where are you calling in from tonight, Angus? 
I'm calling in from um, dark but dry Footscray in Western Melbourne. So I am a colleague of B. Kirk's. So I'm based at Werribee at the University of Melbourne Veterinary School on the southwest outskirts of Melbourne, but I live a little closer into town. I can't fit very many sheep on my very small uh, suburban block here, unfortunately. No, that's fair enough, Angus. Uh, okay, so we've got a few questions coming through. Um, but just while I'm just interpreting the first few questions, Angus, uh, and B, you might be able to weigh in because I, I suggest you know him better than I do, but what were those sheep you were holding in your photo at the front? They were a little bit of a, a, bit, a bit worrying, actually. They were um, funny-looking critters, weren't they? Those we do some, as well as being involved um, in our work in southeastern Australia um, with the sheep and, and beef industries, I also do some work in Pakistan and in Burma, and those sheep were for sale literally outside a suburban shopping centre in Lahore in Pakistan. And it was in the lead up to the religious festival of Eid when people sell uh, very beautifully prepared animals for um, as part of sort of the um, religious sacrifice, which commonly occurs at that time of the year. And so there was a, yep, a fella just walking down the street with those three ewes and their, their fat tails, um, which are a, you know, very popular breed there. And I reckon I'd never quite seen a sheep like that before. They, the tails on them would, would have weighed, you know, 10, 10 plus kilograms. So they're a very unusual looking critter. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that, Angus. Thanks for the description. Uh, probably one of the more interesting places you could go though, I'd imagine. Now, oh, yeah. now, now B, I'll let you be the chair uh, to, to field uh, all the questions, but if you think uh, that Angus is best served to answer one for, for any particular reason, I'll let you pass that on. Or if Angus, if you want to contribute something, don't, don't be shy, just step straight in there. Um, I'm going to lead with a question, actually. actually. Um, at the start of the webinar, we ran a, a quick poll just for a few people who joined us early in the evening asking when they thought the most important time was to drench prime lamb ewes. Now, the overwhelming response, albeit only from 20 or 30 people, uh, however, still a, a, an overwhelming response was that they considered the pre-lambing drench as the most important drench uh, in the calendar. Uh, now, B, I don't, I'm not sure if you're presentation supported that concept 100% this evening. Would you mind explaining to us? Yeah, so I guess um, the strategic drenches are more important um, in terms of your whole farm because they're reducing the contamination in the following autumn and winter. So it's been shown that even low egg counts through the summer months can actually lead to quite a significant contamination in the following growing season, um, which is when worms are most of a problem. However, um, the I guess what a pre-lamb drench can do is stop you from dying. So in that way, um, it, it is important, um, you know, it, um, if you use going to die, if you use are going to die, then it's important to drench them. But in terms of your um, impact on your whole farm system, the summer drenches are more important. Angus, would you, do you have any other comments to add on that? Yeah, I wonder if the other um, important thing to consider there, B, is what you saw in your trial sites in, in Western Victoria. And that was that you, if you took your, your results overall, you didn't see a massive difference, say, in survival between those worm-free ewes that were your control or your comparison ewes and your uh, regular worm management practice mobs um, it, it, when you looked at your data overall would that be a fair call and um, and that the the thing that tended to really drive the the risk of of ewes maybe falling over with with worms around lambing time was actually the condition that they were in and the um, the feed that they had in front of them yeah, yeah, that that's definitely a big qualifier on the worm egg count um, of a ewe pre-lambing or at marking or the ewe mob. Definitely is how much yeah. feed you've got available and what condition yep. they're in. Okay, great. So a pre-lamb drench. Oh yeah, so I was going to say a pre-lamb drench 
in a year when sheep really need a pre-lamb drench, i.e. they're skinny or the feed's really tight, pre-lamb drenches is very important in those years because it's a lifesaver. But the question you've got to ask yourself is in looking at your sheep, how, how often does that occur? And if the feed's good and the ewes are in good condition, then the pre-lamb drench is actually, you don't need that kind of risk management in those years. Mm. And perhaps if that's happening every year, then maybe there are other things that you need to look at other than just yep. worms. Yep. Thanks for that, guys. No, that's excellent. Really good. Now, um, there's a question come here through from Frank. Frank uh, makes, makes a comment and, um, and a question at the same time. Uh, what about the, the one lifetime drench that includes tapeworm control and then and thereafter use culling to enhance immunity? The use of min, then add the use of mineral trace element supplement to support animal systems and avoid the rundown of animal reserves. Any comment on that? Yeah, so firstly, uh, well, the, the first part of the question on a tapeworm drench, um, there's no evidence to say that tapeworms, or no, no evidence is shown that tapeworms um, cause production loss, firstly. Um, so uh, that's answer that part. And the next part was trace element deficiencies, was it? Yeah, there was a comment um, about whether the trace element supplementation um, could help uh, the uh, immune system of the animal, I, I suggest. Uh, so um, the best way to determine whether you've got a trace element problem or whether trace elements would help um, is to um, test for a deficiency. Um, and the best way to do that is in your um, young, so your weaners in late spring. Um, because that's the time when they've had the least amount of soil at the time of the year when they've had the least amount of soil ingestion. So um, if you suspect that you have a deficiency, um, the best thing to do is test for one. Um, yeah, otherwise, um, yeah, it shouldn't be. A, um, so you know, if your trace elements are adequate. Then it's so B, is there any evidence to suggest that um, trace element supplementation would um, assist, you know, the, the defence against worms? Oh, not if they're adequate. Angus, do you have...? There's some sometimes heavily parasitised sheep. There is an interaction between some trace minerals and, and um, the parasite status of sheep, and it's not always clear whether the worms tend to make the sheep absorb the minerals more poorly or whether the uh, low trace mineral status makes the sheep more more susceptible. But it's just as as B says that if you suspect that that's an issue, then what you should do is test directly for the trace mineral status of the sheep. And and the risk if you uh, just go ahead and supplement the animals without properly assessing their status first is that you might be treating with the wrong trace mineral, or you might be getting the the production benefit that you expect. So, and I think the other comment about worms and, and trace minerals and, and the need for, for, for worm treatment is that it probably depends on the, the intensity of your production system. And as you start to increase stocking rates to you know, in, in, improve pr productivity, the risk is that if you, you leave sheep untreated, then at some stage, uh, worms start to creep into the system. Um, and, and if you end up with a, a tight year ahead of you, then suddenly worms are having a much much bigger effect, and so I suppose the idea of using things like rams with uh, low egg count um, ASBVs is you're absolutely selecting for um, uh, for sheep that are more resistant to parasites. But the the problem is that it's probably hard to uh, have a, a highly productive system when that's the only thing that you rely on, even though it's a really important part of your ally. Mm, great, thank you, Gus. Um, a good question here from Rob. Uh, Rob um, joins us from up near Laris Lee. Good to see you online tonight, Rob. Rob's got two short questions. Uh, uh, he, Rob wonders about, firstly, about long-acting cydectin uh, pre-lambing, and he also is wondering about the possibility of drench resistance, uh, promoting drench resistance. Uh, when you're 
using utilizing that second summer drench. So the first question around long acting cydectin pre lambing, and the second question around promoting drench resistance through using that second summer drench. Uh, so firstly, with the long acting cydectin, I guess um, it's similar to a capsule in that um, you we've we've found that. Um, most of the time it's not worthwhile. So I guess the same applies in terms of um, what, um, you know, what sort of condition are you using and what how much feed have you got ahead of you in terms of is it worth giving that long acting treatment or not. Um, there has um, also been up in the Northern Tablelands they found that um, the there were some implications of um, the side actin, long acting side actin um, uh, being um, sort of making its way through into the ewes milk as well. Um, and so therefore the lamb um, was getting a very low dose as well. And um, there were some questions about what implication that might have for resistance um, in the long term. And then maybe, I, if you like, B, I could chip in on that. The other part of the question, David, was about the risk of selecting for drench resistance, um, particularly at the time of the second summer drench. Is that right? Yes, yeah, put on, Angus. Yeah, and that's certainly it has it can be an issue, particularly in drier environments. And and maybe that was the the Western Australian experience was that um, when you've got a very dry summer. Uh, the only worms on the farm are the worms that are inside the sheep. And that second summer drench, if you have very few larvae surviving out on pasture, um, is a very strong selector for drench resistance. It's kind of like you imagine the drench in the, at the time of the second summer drench is like the, the, nuclear, the nuclear holocaust and the only worms that repopulate the farm after the drench are the ones that have got those resistant genes. So in a dry environment, the second summer drench can be uh, a risky selector for drench resistance. But the best way to find out whether those sheep need that second summer drench is to do an, an egg count before you, you want to drench them. And if they've got a very, very low egg count, we're probably talking about less than 50 to 80 eggs per gram, then you don't need to give that drench. Uh, and then you're reducing that uh, risk of selecting for resistance. On the other hand, if the, the sheep have got a, an egg count of, um, higher than 50 to 80 eggs per gram around the time of the second summer drench, if the egg count's greater than that, then they, you should drench them. But it also suggests that you've got enough larvae floating around on the farm that you've got a, a lower selection pressure for resistance by giving the, the drench in that time. So it's a very, whether or not you use the second summer drench very, very depends on your environment. Dry environments, probably try to shy away from it or, or and test beforehand. Um, wetter environments like we have in parts of the, uh, particularly or Western Victoria, or many parts of Victoria and Southeastern New South Wales, um, th there'll be a less selection on resistance in that second summer drench is very important. Great, thanks for that Angus. That's a good, some good comments there. Now, another question here from Steve. Steve asks, is confinement feeding over the summer a good tool to clean out ewes and pastures from worms or does it become a worm haven? Should I be drenching my ewes in and or out of the confinement feeding scenario? That's from Steve. Yeah, I think Angus, have you got any comments on this one? Um, yes, thanks for that, B. Um, I, I think that the... Um, Absolutely, that confinement feeding is a is a great way to, when you think in, in southern Australia, your winter worm problems come from that late spring and, and autumn contamination. So if you've got sheep in confinement areas at that time, then you're contaminating the confinement area and you're, you're not contaminating the paddocks that you want to graze through the winter. Probably, unless the sheep have, again, that really low count, you know, only 50 odd eggs per gram, um, they probably do need to be drenched into it into the confinement area because the last thing you want to do when you've got all that precious feed going down their throats is to be feeding the worms rather than feeding the sheep. And I think uh, when it comes to taking them out, then again, uh, an egg count 
is a really useful useful tool. And so you can make your, your drenching decision uh, as the sheep exit the containment area based on what their what their egg count is. Um, and I suppose it kind of just really emphasises how important that regular monitoring of sheep for worms is. It's a you know typically a 30 odd dollar test when you're doing a bulk bulk egg count for a mob. That'll be 10 to 20 samples, and it just gives you and it, it'll you get it into a lab overnight. You'll get a result within a day or two, and it gives you so much more information to brace your base your drenching decisions on than just trying to guess how the sheep are travelling by by eyeballing them. That's great, Gus. Thank you very much for that. Um, now, I've got a really good question here from Patrick, and it's a good question because Patrick's taken the time to, uh, to outline specifically what he's asking. Now, in a rotational grazing program with the pasture rest period um, impacting the, the larvae number aside, is there a relationship between the pasture leaf height and worm intake. For instance, say if in a system they graze consistently from 2,000 kilograms down to 1,200 kilograms of dry matter per hectare versus a system that's grazing from 1,200 kilograms down to 600 kilograms. So any comment on that, B? Yeah, so um, the that is true. So the most of the worms or worm larvae are found on the so the lower, the bottom two two centimeters of pasture. So by keeping um, um, by keeping your pasture longer, um, you uh, your um, sheep will be eating less larvae, as well as um, hopefully you'll get some benefit in terms of um, con body condition as well of the sheep. So um, yes, you, they but they should be. Um, um, eating less larvae. And I suppose also um, we need to remember what sort of conditions are conducive to larvae as well. So remember they need um, moisture to um, become available. They like moist conditions. So if pasture is dry, um, they're not likely, well, they, they're not gonna be able to become available um, in a dry environment either. Okay, great. Thanks for that, B. A question here from Chris. Chris asked, he had a scenario just at his place um, earlier this year. Their worm egg count was less than 50 in mature ewes in early December, so around that period where you're testing for the uh, some first summer drench. Uh, now, Chris is in a higher rainfall, southwest slopes area, so, so southwest slopes in New South Wales, and they're lamb in July. Uh, he, he didn't drench on the back of that worm egg count. Do you think the decision was reasonable? And what to do then? Um, and the worm egg count ended up being greater than 500 at scanning, so he drenched them, but the sheep were still healthy. So some comment there, B? Yeah, so um, firstly, it's been shown that even really low egg counts, um, so even less than 50 eggs per gram in that early summer are contributing um, to, are contaminating the pasture for the following autumn, um, which is sort of around the time of scanning, I guess. So um, over, although the counts are very low, um, by drenching then you're reducing the pasture contamination in the following growing season. And especially if you're doing that over um, consecutive years too, um, you're reducing the overall pasture contamination um, on the farm. So I guess my question um, would be um, with that 500 eggs per gram, um, whether um, we know what sort of worms they were. Oh, was there, a, I suppose we don't know, because no, I suppose Chris has, that... Um, Chris, you might be able to just text in quickly. Um, what those worms were, if you had a, a larval thing done. Yeah, I guess it just um, because the the type of worm uh, is one of the determinants as to whether Chris, there are clinical. Whether... Mostly homonchus, over ninety percent homonchus. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, the the threshold for drenching 
um, with homonchus is um, much higher as well. So that could explain, I suppose, why um, they weren't showing signs um, of worms because the um, because homonchus are really prolific egg layers. So um, you you know have fewer worms producing more eggs. So, and so that could explain uh, that part of it. So, B, are you suggesting that um, Chris probably should have drenched um, at, in December when there was an indication of worms and and then he may not have had to have drenched at scanning time or his worm egg counts might have been much lower at scanning time? Is that is that a suggestion? Well, they may, they may have been lower, um, but it's, yeah, it really depends on other things like you condition and the season as well. Angus, what comment would you have on that? Yeah, it sounds like it's for Chris. It was kind of right on that that threshold. And one of the 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 ongoing gaps in our knowledge is exactly what is that threshold for giving those summer drenches. You know, we say it's kind of around the fifty to to eighty eggs per gram. But to, to tell you the honest truth, there's there's no um, re, there's no real research um, evidence to tell us inform us really clearly about exactly what that cutoff should be. In some ways, I wonder for Chris whether he kind of probably was going to always have to give one drench to those sheep, and he he made the call that he was about on that cutoff of maybe do I don't I at about 50 eggs per gram in December, and those 500 eggs per gram for use at, at scanning time when it's mainly mainly barber's pole is probably just sailing under the the desperate need to drench those ewes. But it, it sounds like it was a sort of season where one drench was kind of going to be an, an inevitability. If if with the wisdom of hindsight. He had to drench the ewes in December at 50 eggs per gram. Chances are they wouldn't have needed the drench at scanning, but he still would have given one drench to the sheep. So my feeling is it was probably one drench was always going to happen. And what he got was um, a little bit of peace of mind. And he also used that ongoing monitoring so that he wasn't caught out, say, in uh, late pregnancy, suddenly with ewes that were at 1,000 eggs per gram and are starting to get a bit anemic with Barber's pole. So I think he still actually has showed the the importance of, of monitoring and making a you know a, an informed decision based on those monitoring results. Mm, great. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Angus. That's really good. Um, now, there's a comment from Ross. Uh, Ross is up on the central tablelands. It's not exactly a, a question, but he wanted to make the audience this evening aware that he's up on the central tablelands of New South Wales, and they've noticed that Barber's Pole has become an increasingly big problem with infestations occurring in ewes and lambs at foot, even in June and July. Would that, is that something that you'd expect to be, or is that uh, sound counterintuitive? Uh, well, yeah, resistance is um, increasing in barber's poles, so, um, but it is alarming to hear. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's when um, other forms of um, worm control or other aspects of worm control programs become really important um, and perhaps um, I just wonder how many people um, up in uh, the um, tablelands are using the barberback, barbervax for example. Yeah okay well thank you thank you. Um, good comment Ross. Um, uh, Bruce is looking for a a broad comment here from either B or Angus. Uh, do you have any comment on the different fat lamb breeds and their inherent worm resistance? Uh, so is that um, on the resistance of the lambs? I guess um, there's more variability within a breed than uh, between breeds. So I would suggest that it's more important to look at um, WEC ASBVs um, than to go than to go for a, a specific breed. Okay, no, that's, that's good advice. So um, it's more important just to look at uh, ASBVs rather than breeds and there's plenty of variation between within each breed as well. So now question here. Yeah, and I, I think it's also Sorry, go, B. I was just going to say, um, there's also um, variability between environments as well. So I guess um, if you're bringing an animal 
um, or a, a bloodline from a different environment, you don't necessarily know how it's going to perform in your environment. So, for example, bringing um, you know something from the Northern Tablelands down to Western Victoria, um, it's you know, might perform quite differently. Okay, uh, fair enough. Thank you. Um, Quish, oh, so Ross just made a quick comment. Uh, Ross, Ross comment on the Barber's poll. Ross said, oh, he's understanding that the summer drenches are likely to result in the development of drench resistance. So we've already covered that question. And yes, Ross, you're, you're, there is some instances um, which Angus outlined uh, worked very, really well before that um, that it can lead to a development of drench resistance. So there is some, some consideration given to that before um, jumping into multiple summer trenches. A question from Ken here. Um, now, this is referring back to that comment on the pre-lamb drench versus, you know, other, other drenches. Uh, so for the pre-lamb drench, what would the egg count need to be before you implemented it, assuming you had good, uh, a good summer drench program ahead of you? Uh, B? Uh, so I guess it uh, would depend what environment, um, but in our environment down here in Western Victoria, I guess um, a cutoff or maybe an indication um, for whether to give a pre lamb drench or not might be about sort of 250 eggs per gram. But as we saw um, <clears throat> with uh, the Lifting the Limits project, we did, it really was heavily influenced by the U condition score at um, pre-lambing and also the amount of feed available as well. So um, I'd suggest that those pieces of information are, um, they need to be, interp they need to be given and interpreted right alongside um, worm egg count. Well, that's, that's great advice, B. So what I'm picking up from that, actually a question from me, B, is that, <coughs> Um, so you indicated before that the uh, worm egg counts on Barber's, coal, Barber's Pole in some instances can go up to uh, 1,000 uh, grams uh, uh, eggs per gram before, before drenching. Is that now, what's the minimum threshold? Uh, and what sort of, uh, sorry, no. For the other worms, do they all work in a similar range? Uh, that is obviously not the same range as the uh, barber's pole. Uh, not quite. So um, I guess so further north, so um, in the um, southwest slopes, um, they tend to have uh, more trite colubra formis, so just a different species of trichostrongolus, and so, um, which is a bit less pathogenic than the ones that will sort of cause, a bit less likely to cause disease, I suppose, than um, the species that we see down here in, um, in um, Western Victoria. And so the threshold there is a little bit higher, um, so that, you know, 300 to 700 eggs per gram, um, but again, needs to be interpreted with other information, but yeah, so um, th no, the thresholds aren't all the same. Yeah. No, no. Oh, sorry, David. I was just going to say the um, the Worm Boss website. Their uh, regional drenching guides have got these uh, great tables where they have, or exactly summarised what B's talking about. Where you've got uh, sheep with um, a tight, adequate, plentiful feed in front of them, and sheep in light, um, moderate to um, uh, better forward condition and then they've got the sorts of recommended um, cutoffs for the kinds of worms that the sheep are likely to experience in those environments and they've got them for the different regions throughout um, particularly um, eastern and southeastern Australia and they're great guides for producers to refer to because they're really based on the, the local species of worms they're likely to encounter um, and then also take into account the sorts of stuff that bees has been talking about um, this evening. Yeah, great. That's really good. Thank you, Angus. B, could you just dial back one slide? I noticed you had those resources listed there. And if you just go back one slide, then people will be able to, uh, you know, drop that down on a piece of paper they need to and go and look it up in their spare time. Now, a question here from... Um, I'm just looking here so I don't miss any. Sorry, guys. Oh, 
Okay, another question from Ross. Also, a small burdle of worms doesn't... Uh, so, Ross is asking whether a small burdle of worms enables the sheep to develop a level of tolerance to future worm burdens. Is that is that the case, B? Uh, it is in that it's it's not the burden as such, it's the incoming larvae. And so when sheep are, are seeing larvae all the time, they're eating the larvae on the pasture, um, that's, they're developing immunity there. They, it's not so much the adult worms, um, it's the incoming larvae that help to um, develop the immunity. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there's a question here from Alan. Alan's from up near Burrawa. Uh, good to see you online tonight, Alan. Um, does uh, uh, sorry does uh, does not using the pre lamb drench increase pasture contamination? That's from Alan. Uh, no, it doesn't because there's it's the time of really high larval availability anyway, and so. Um, it's giving a pre lamb drench is really just a, a worm free day. Um, and so um, it, it doesn't have an effect on the overall population of the worms. Angus, would you have any comments on that? Yeah, I think that's a, no, that's a good way to summarise it, Be the, the larvae that are on the pastures in, you know, in, in winter when those prime lamb use the lambing, those larvae came from many months before and and particularly if you're a sort of midwinter lamb, the, the temperatures are quite cold, and so the eggs that the, the sheep are, are, um, are putting out onto pastures around that time will take many, many months to develop into infective larvae. So stopping the contamination there doesn't really change because the system, as like they said, the system was already, or well, the contamination had had already occurred um, a long time beforehand. Okay, great. Well, thank you. That's a good good answer. Um, Question here from Chris again. Um, Chris is inquiring around the weaning drench. Now, is it okay to use worm egg count to determine the need for the weaning drench? Uh, for example, if you're in late September, um, you're at 15 weeks uh, post, uh, post lambing, um, and the worm egg counts are somewhere between zero and 50, um, would you drench uh, pre-marketing in that scenario? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. So um, with lambs, I guess it's a fairly high proportion of the worms in them are at that pre-patent stage. So they're not yet um, late, they're not yet producing eggs and so they won't show up in a worm egg count. So even though worm egg counts um, in these lambs might be low, um, they have an increasing worm burden. And so um, we can be, um, I guess, we can be unaware of, of how big their worm burden is, which is, I mean, it's sort of increasing exponentially as they get older. Um, but a lot of their worms are in that pre-patent period as, you know, as a proportion. And so we can't see them in an egg count, if you like, because an egg count is only um, showing us the worms that are actually producing eggs. It's not showing us the immature worms. Okay, no, so that's a good point. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, now, question here from um, from John. John, I think I think uh, that Angus answered this in a sense before. Is there a threshold to pre lamb drench if the ewes have good food and good body condition? So. John, I, we, the recommendation from Angus there was to go to the Worm Boss website. Uh, it's listed there on B's slide as a resource. Uh, Angus said there's some great um, tables in there that provide um, thresholds for the exact, for exactly uh, those those conditions or those set of scenarios that you're providing us this evening. So I recommend you go and have a look at that. Question here from Matthew. Does a ewe's ability to cope with a worm burden decrease as she approaches the point of lambing? How far out from the point of lambing should a pre lanch drench be given? From Matthew B. Uh, yes. Have a very steady um, 
program in the um, and oh, B, B, your internet, B, your internet's failing on you there. I think um, um, you seem to be cutting in and out. Could you just go again, please? Uh, yeah. So um, the yes, the ewe's immune system does decrease. So um, around the time of lambing, she becomes a lot more um, susceptible to worms. Um, so yes, it does happen, and it's um, quite a complex um, hormonal change, um, and it happens uh, sort of variable time, um, but very late pregnancy and sort of early lactation, and it tends to be a lot less pronounced in um, in crossbred or um, prime lamb ewes than it does in merinos. Yes, yeah, spot on, B. Thank you for that. Um, and and there was a second part to that question. Oh, so oh, so the timing of the prelam drench. Yeah, yeah. If you were to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess um, bearing in mind that you're not going to make a long term difference um, to the used body weight or um, her lamb's weight. Um, you know, if in terms of just stopping them um, from dying um, those ewes that are right on the edge I guess the closer to lambing the better if you needed to do it however um, it's really important not to um, keep them off feed for too long and therefore run into metabolic problems as well yeah right yeah okay thank you thank you another question from Alan here Alan asks um, does cydectin long acting and capsules have uh, produce any increase in production from lambs post weaning, B? Uh, so I think um, as Ian Carmichael and um, the Lifting Limits, like us at Lifting Limits found, um, it's a lot of it is down to nutrition. And so um, I would say given, I'd be hesitant to recommend um, giving a long acting treatment after weaning as opposed to um, a timely weaning drench. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, question here from Melanie. Uh, now, it's just a little bit, little bit cryptic, Melanie, but we'll try. Can capsules be used to help clean a paddock when you don't have access to cattle? Uh, if using capsules to assist in cleaning paddocks, are we better to use a combo? or single active in the capsule? Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, capsules could be used strategically, I suppose. Um, I think more work needs to be done on that, um, but they potentially could be used, um, I think Melanie might be referring to using them over the summer, um, rather than um, the short acting drenches or well, I guess as a general comment um, we'd need to be really careful that um, we haven't got any resistance um, to the capsules and yes it would be definitely be better to use a combination rather than a single active um, as with all our drenches um, so we need to make sure that that capsule is um, completely effective because um, if uh, you know, that the few worms that might be resistant to that capsule will have a really long um, reproductive advantage over the susceptible worms. So that's the caveat in all this is that um, we're potentially giving um, any worms that are uh, resistant to the capsule a 90-day head start reproductively over the susceptible worms. Thanks, B. Thank you. Now, James uh, asked a question here. James, I, I fear that your question may be the um, may have the, the sixty-five dollar answer. So, if we could answer this um, one hundred percent, then we'd, we'd have the situation now. But let's let's try. B might have some good insight for us. 
James asks, should we drench sheep into a clean paddock or should you drench them, put them back into the same paddock to let them expel the worms and then put them into a clean paddock? How do we balance refugia, trying to leave some worms behind that aren't resistant whilst trying to reduce the worm population? Any comments there, B? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and I was hoping that refusia would uh, come up tonight. Um, so the answer to that is that um, it's really dependent upon what area you're in. So um, in Western Victoria, um, we've the work's been done to show that we get um, really good larval survival um, over the summer months, and so we've got a lot of refugia there already. Um, we don't need to worry about sort of creating more refugia or um, or such strategies. Um, it's a different um, story in areas like Western Australia where um, they've got such a long, hot, dry summer um, that the larval survival is low. Or in a, um, for example, um, on a farm where there's a lot of uh, cropping area, they've um, that's the sort of situation where you've got less refugia as well. And so you do need to, um, in, you may need to involve um, other strategies potentially. Um, but speaking for this area, that sort of strategy is not something that um, we would need to do. There are enough worms out there already. No, oh, great, thank you. Question from Melanie, how much of this information being given is also about protecting the integrity of our drenches? I'm curious, not a scientist, uh, 50 eggs per gram isn't a very high number, so wouldn't it be this be attributing to resistance problems? Yeah, that's um, a really good question as well. So um, I guess um, it's sort of a, a seesaw, I guess, when you... Um, increase the number of drenches, um, you also, um, you're increasing control, um, but you might be, um, you know, increasing your resistance problems as well. Um, if you never drench, then, um, you know, you've, you're um, going to have, your drenches are likely to remain effective, but you won't have good control of your worms. So, um, I guess these um, summer drenches, and again, it's, it's, specific to an environment. So one size doesn't fit all. Um, in our environment, um, you can use, you can give the summer drenches at those thresholds um, because we've got enough, um, we've got enough larvae in the system. Angus, would you have any comment on that? Yeah, it's a, Melanie makes a really good um, comment. That 50 eggs per gram, even though it's so low, coming out of adult sheep, um, that's enough contamination at those critical times of the year in late spring and mid to later autumn to lead to a really significant winter worm problems. And so, yes, it's a low number, but it's it's high enough to cause cause trouble for sheep um, going into the in, into the winter um, if that contamination is allowed to get through. So, the way you manage it is when it's less than that, or you know, when the sheep are come back with a, z a zero test or a very, very low test, the way to, to preserve those drenches is to, to test beforehand and, and not use it when, when, the, um, uh, when the egg counts are really, really low. And that becomes more and more important as you, um, when you're running sheep in drier and drier environments. So yep, it's a low number, but it's, it's still enough contamination to uh, cause problems in, in in the following winter if you let it slip slip through. But but monitoring and 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 making your drenching decisions based on monitoring is the the key. Another um, question here um, um, from James: In a wet environment like Western Victoria, um, how many times would you expect to drench in a typical season? B. Uh, that's a good question. Um, the answer is it really varies. So it varies depending on um, the worm control history um, on your farm and what sort of enterprise you're running um, and uh, what and on the season as well, um, you know, whether you've um, had successive years of well-timed summer drenches, etc. So I guess um, yeah, it's it's a really difficult one. 
uh, because it's on there are so many variables involved yeah, so I guess that you know the, the same thing holds true is that you one or two summer drenches and then monitor and monitoring is really important and, and realistically it's been an excellent year if you um, you would expect to give one to two drenches during the winter to mobs on the farm um, even when you've given a you know when you've had a moderately successful summer drench um, in the, in the over the preceding season so it's a it's an excellent an excellent year when you uh, haven't had to get the the drench gun out um, probably at least once for a few mobs and I suppose the ones you're particularly going to be having to treat will be wieners and, and maiden ewes um, but what you're I suppose what you're aiming to do is to to minimize that but it's it's probably unrealistic to expect that there will be um, you know no drenches given that need to be given to sheep during the winter um, but if things have been going well then uh, hopefully you uh, you know only one to two for some mobs on the farm would be the kind of thing that you're aiming for okay great okay a quick comment here if adult sheep in good condition are resilient to worms only prime lamb use in the flock why any summer drench uh, summer drenching was aimed at minimizing the risk to merino weaners in mid to late winter if lambing in late winter no young sheep are at risk over the over winter the, um, no young sheep are at risk over the winter there's none on the farm the crux of drenching is any flock uh, is identify what you are trying to achieve um, yeah, everything you're saying be is spot on but it is still influenced by having young sheep on the farm really need to look at individual farm management to decide so good comment there any comment from your side there B? yeah I think it's a good comment as well I guess um, we did find that um, our hoggets were really vulnerable so people lambing hoggets um, I mean that preparing pastures for them using smart grazing um, is definitely worth um, looking into uh, because they are a vulnerable group of animals and within even within a fairly resilient um, group of um, use such as you know in prime lamb flocks there are still subsets of them um, that um, are uh, more vulnerable than others so the lighter use for example um, the you know if you've got a if you're scanning for triplets the triplet bearing use um, so there even in that system there are subsets of animals that would um, benefit from lower um, contaminated pastures and those older age groups of use and you know producers are often keeping sheep a little bit older in a you know, crossbred system or a prime lamb system, and and they're the ones, particularly if they're if they're bearing multiples, and they end up being a little lighter than you'd like them to be, or on slightly tighter feed. Again, they're they're very they're very vulnerable. And in lots of ways, those summer drenches are. It's about risk management. You know, you don't know what the season's going to look like when you're giving a summer drench to sheep, but you you're doing it to reduce the risk, the worm risk um, that some of those vulnerable groups that B talks about are. Um, might be exposed to as they go through the, the winter and into early spring approaching lambing. Mm, okay, well that's great, thanks Angus. Um, um, Alan, uh, I can see that you were asking about the contamination um, of spring not in the winter, but I'm just having trouble nailing down that specific question. Alan, would you mind just resubmitting your question again? I apologise for that. And I'll make sure I um and, and I'll make sure I, I'll ask it of B and Angus Adam to get a good answer for you. Um, quick comment: worm um, worm egg count in prime lamb ewes to determine pre lamb drench uh, not logical if ewes are in good conditions. Um, we think that um, could be seen in the graphs that B showed earlier. Thank, thanks for that comment. And my father always said that when sheep have a snotty nose after they've been shedded overnight, it is a sign of worms and they need to be drenched. Is this true? V? Uh, I have not come across any evidence uh, of that. Yes, have you any Angus? snotty nose no. are of worms? No. no, 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 I haven't. There's um, 
And I think the you know the the great thing for us these days is we've got a a simple, pretty convenient test. You know, it's, you've got to collect a few fecal samples, but you can pick them fresh up off the ground. And so, you, you know, as a, with a few caveats that that B meant described before, it's a it's a great way to work out whether the sheep need drenching or not. Do a do a worm egg count um, rather than um, relying on some of those um, those other um, other potential Diagnostic signs or ones that we've. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Great. Right. Yeah. Now, a quick question from um, Ross uh, again. Thanks. Thanks, Ross, for being a, a big contributor tonight. Is there anything achieved by keeping sheep off feed after their drench, or can they be put straight back onto pasture without affecting drench efficacy? Any comment there, B? Uh, Yet yeah, they can be put straight back out onto pasture. Um, yeah, that's that's fine. There's no um, gains in efficacy uh, from keeping them off feed. There was some stuff that the CSIRO many years ago had had a, a couple of kind of um, recommendations around drenching around withholding feed and, and so on and so forth. But I think just one of the, the problems was that it often became, it, it just it sort of, it just makes it a little less, less practical, you know, that you've got to sort of keep sheep in yards for, for extended periods of time. And the the gains are, you know, compared to all the other things that um, have been discussed tonight, are, are just, you know, they're just a, a much sort of smaller component to, to what people, you know, to the other big ticket items that we've been talking about this evening too. Okay, right ahead. Thank you. Um, a quick comment here from one of the participants. A few worms in the system don't seem to be, are not a problem. The sheep develop uh, immunity. It is only in young sheep and sheep in poor condition when scour worms will cause problems. If ewes are in good condition, uh, there are no real problems. Capsules and long-acting cydectin are uh, useful in emergencies, but I'll, we could, I, I don't suspect they're any good for normal management. So thanks for that comment there. Uh, so Frank asked a question here. Thanks for the question, Frank. Um, he asks about cool burning in autumn to reduce paddock contamination prior to the break. Um, I think my, uh, uh, my, my initial, the premise of that question would that be that you're going to have enough dry pasture in the autumn to burn and, um, and, not, uh, and not cause you any feed gap issues, Frank. But uh, let's just talk to B about the cool burning and whether that um, can reduce paddock contamination before the break. Yeah, I guess uh, that would be my um, uh, my question as well. Is where does that leave you in terms of, um, of you know feed availability? So I just wonder whether the you know the other strategies uh, would be more helpful or more um, practical, I suppose, in terms of um, the feed feed gap in the autumn. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, B. No, that's fine. Um, now, quick question here from James. Uh, if you only have StarTect and Zolvex left as your effective drenches, uh, what would you? What would a drench program look like only using these two drenches in a wet environment? Um, James only has sheep, so he has StarTech and Zolvex left in his uh, left in the. Uh, in his toolbox, but um, he hasn't got any other effective wrenches left. Yeah, I just wonder, James, whether you've whether any of your combinations are effective. Um, so that would be a question. Um, and I guess using the summer strategic treatments or strategic treatments over summer to reduce partial larval contamination, um, making sure that um, nutrition is, um, that ewes are in um, good condition score and got the feed ahead of them using rands with low, low worm egg count ASBVs as well. Yeah. So those are all um, other aspects of a worm control program. Yeah. Okay, that's a good, that's a good comment there. Thank you very much. Um, a quick question uh, down to our last two questions. B, uh, I promise. 
unless there's a few more to come in. Um, a quick question here from Matthew. Um, how long does it take to clean a paddock by spelling over summer, assuming dry conditions? So um, assuming dry conditions, I guess, so three months of uh, heat would decrease um, the larvae, uh, the number of larvae quite a lot. Also um, intermittent rain over the summer um, so uh, can help as well if the paddock isn't grazed. So um, in the summer also larvae um, can, they're sort of in, in a cyst that is quite resistant to heat um, and they need once they receive moisture, um, so dew in the cooler months or uh, rain in the warmer months, um, they will come out of the cyst and become available. But if nothing, once they're in that stage where they're available to be infecting a sheep, um, if it becomes hot again, then all the, then those larvae die. So um, intermittent rain um, and if a paddock is not grazed after the rain um, can actually... Um, help to um, reduce the number of larvae on there as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. I didn't, I didn't know that, B, so thanks for that. It's, um, it's something to take home tonight. Now, earlier this evening, Alan from uh, but, um, um, up in the Harden um, district, he asked uh, whether not using the pre-lamb drench increased um, infection of the pastures. Um, I think we may we may have misinterpreted his question. He asked whether then that you know omitting the pre lamb drench increased uh, partial contamination in the spring. Um, so, is there any comment there? Be whether the, if we don't use a pre lambing drench, you know, obviously in early to mid winter, uh, whether we increase spring pasture contamination. No, um, there are so many worms in the system at that time of year. Um, it's not going to increase the contamination. And also um, spring is actually the time where we see a decrease in the um, contamination or the amount of larvae available on pasture um, because of that dilution effect of spring growth. Um, and also um, when it gets um, warmer and drier, the larvae um, start to die. Yeah, right. So it, it, it won't increase the contamination. So there's no there's no deleterious effect on on spring pasture on spring production as a result of the pre not uh, delivering a pre lambing drench. No, that's correct. So um, our summer or the summer drenches in a temperate. Um, area, the summer drenches are the time when um, we have the chance to um, have an effect on things down, you know, in the in the following growing season. But in the winter, um, it's all about just trying to manage the worm burden of animals. Yep. Okay. Uh, a quick question here from James. Uh, James asks, is there a benefit in drenching sheep and then putting them back into the same paddock dumped out for a few days before putting them into a clean paddock. Now, we've already had that question, um, but B, maybe I'll just rehash that quickly. Uh, yeah, so I guess it, it's, um, it is a bit unique to the environment, um, but in a temperate area, we've got enough refugia. So the, the refugia, refugia is the proportion of a worm population that isn't, um, affected by a drench. So we've got enough uh, worms on our pastures already um, that um, trying to create more does not have a big effect yeah. on our worm resistance, yeah. drench resistance. Okay. Uh, in the same vein, um, no, 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 sorry. Yeah, back, back on the pre lamb drench again, just quickly for Steve. Um, they do a spring drop. Would you pre lamb drench for a spring drop? I, I suspect, I suspect B, that it, it'll be to, subject to a range of caveats that you discussed before, but is there anything different with a spring drop? I guess um, with a spring drop, you're heading into that time of decreasing pasture larval availability. So um, you haven't got, assuming um, that the 
um, and I guess I'm talking about the temperate areas again. Um, so we haven't really got that those same conditions of high larval availability and um, low pasture availability in spring as we have in winter. So I guess that's one more argument not to give a pre-lamb drench if it's a spring drop. Yeah, okay. Well, that's, um, that's fine. Thank you, B. Now, B, there's just been a bit of uh, interest rekindled in the earlier question about the burn of pastures in the autumn. Are you aware of any research to, to demonstrate the uh, eff efficacy of, of burning burning off pastures or maybe even stubble on the reduction of, um, of you know, uh, contamination on pastures? Yeah, so as far as I'm aware, um, it is effective in um, reducing pasture contamination or killing off larvae, um, that intense heat, um, and also um, cultivating um, and sowing also decreases um, or kills off a lot of larvae as well. Yeah, okay, perfect, thank you. But I guess the, the thing is then, you know, um, what pasture do you have available for the, um, you know, obviously it's gonna be a while before that, that pasture is available to be grazed. Yeah. Yeah, um, no, for sure. Now, uh, there's a bit of just one or two questions come in here. Uh, at any one stage, what proportion of the worm population is present on the pasture compared to the worm burden in the actual sheep? I assume greater than 80% of the worms present on pasture compared to the worms in the sheep? Question mark. That's from Ross. Any comment there, B? Uh, so it really varies. Um, throughout the year. So, for example, in the winter, um, the there's more, the proportion of larvae on pasture is higher than the proportion of the population in the animal. Um, and in the summer, um, the reverse is true, particularly in um, uh, areas with hot, dry summers. So, um, in, in those instances, um, the proportion of the worm population um, is also, most of the worm population is in the animals at that time of year. Yeah, okay. No, that's perfect. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Now, there's one more quick question here. Um, um, uh, how does the height of pasture impact the ability of reinfection? How high can the worm climb up? I think you may have answered this before, but just a quick wrap on that, Pete. Oh, yeah. So, the, um, the highest number of worms is in the sort of, I guess, the, the lower down to the um, or the lower to the ground, the more worms there are there. So, say so the bottom two centimetres or so of the sword have the most worms, worm larvae available. Yeah, okay. Well, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, B. well, that's the last question that we have, and you've, you've maintained a really good audience very late, which is um, testimony to your, you know, your ability to answer the questions and um, keep everyone engaged. So thank you so much for that. It's uh, been a great session. No worries, David. No worries, David. Oh, great. Thanks, Angus. Yeah, Angus, thanks for joining us tonight. It's been a, your, your contributions have been much appreciated. Oh, it's been a, a pleasure to be on board. Thank you very much for having us both, David, and well done, B. Yeah, well done, B, and, and thanks to the, the McKinnon Project for supporting the MLA webinars, um, as they have done in the past through other presenters, and we look forward to working with them in the future on new and exciting topics. So that's, that's the evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'll invite you to participate uh, in the post-webinar survey. Um, if B, uh, subject to B's approval, I'll be able to send out some information on tonight's webinar. And we look forward to seeing you online next week to listen to Dr. Paul Nylon from Tasmania talk about other uh, disease, uh, met 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 metabolic <laughs> metabolic diseases uh, to prime lamb use at and around the point of lambing and how we may be able to cost effectively manage them. So it should be a great evening. Wednesday night next week. Um, looking forward to have everyone back on board and um, look forward to seeing you then. Have a good evening.